Hi, everyone. In my circle of believers, this particular topic about spirit of infirmity never comes up. Surely it shouldn't be taboo. And yet most ministers I know won't even talk about it, won't bring it up. They just intentionally ignore it. But there are several scriptures that will deal with this topic, and I want to bring it up. I can't ignore it if it's in the Bible. I suggest you get the printout of this sermon and just follow along, and all the scriptures will be there too. And that will be your notes. Anyway, is there a spirit of infirmity, of, of, of sickness, of illness? And there clearly is, as I'll show you. But does that also mean, then, that there are demons like some ministers preach? That there are demons who specialize in being a spirit of cancer, a spirit of, of COVID-19, or a spirit of stroke, or a spirit of depression, or whatever. Are there demons that specialize, as more and more seem to be teaching that, on the other hand? Not among my circle, <laughs> it seems like. Anyway, but like a demon of uh, depression, like I said. But what, what do we read about all this in Scripture? I find it interesting that in so many cases of healings, whenever Jesus and the apostles were healing people, you'll find that a lot of times it's mentioned uh, that there was some connection to a demon uh, involved with that illness. Not, not every time, not most times maybe, but a demon that was cast out at the same time, as you'll soon see. Now, first, let's establish Scripture does not, or I mean, I'm sorry, does speak of spirits who can keep people in prolonged illnesses, being sick for a long time, spirit of infirmity. I'm not saying this applies to everybody or every sickness. I'm not. I'm not saying that. But the Bible and Jesus himself will tell us there is such a thing as a spirit of infirmity in some cases. I hope this audio sermon will clarify this topic. So again, I'm Philip Shields. Welcome to Light on the Rock. I'm glad you're coming here. Feel free to tell others about this website if you're being blessed by it. And uh, there are many, many, many audio sermons, video sermons, blogs. And so it's not just what you see on the page, but be sure you start using the search uh, bar as well. And uh, you'll find many, many topics on here. The blogs are, I think... Interesting, shorter studies, kind of like sermonettes. So enjoy that too. Okay, but going back to the spirit of infirmity. Neither do I believe, as some teach, that there are spirits that specialize, like spirit of, in, of disability, of stroke. I just don't see that kind of specificity in Scripture. The Bible is not, not that specific about that. So no, I don't believe that there's a spirit that specializes in COVID-19 or something. All the Bible does tell us, though, is that sometimes a person gets a malady caused by a demon that God apparently had given permission to. And especially for children of God, God has to give that permission. I'm going to elaborate on that a little more as we go along. But yes, we're in a spiritual warfare, as Ephesians 6 clearly says, but neither should we give more power to demons than the Bible does. Don't be afraid of demons. Don't tamper with them, but don't be afraid of them. We have far more power than they have. And especially with God's children, they can only go as far as God allows. So that should comfort you. But my point is, God does allow that from time to time. And it's possible. I'm saying possible. Not always every time, but possible that we open the door to these evil spirits if we live or have lived a life of uncleanness, immorality, uh, careless control of our minds, and things like that, as you'll see. Also, a lot of people open the door to the disease, never mind the spirits, by their own unhealthy lifestyle. Lacking exercise, eating a lot of junk food, sweets, letting themselves become obese or overly stressed, or living in immorality. Yes, I preach myself too. I've done those things too, or at least some of them. Probably we all have had at least periods of unhealthy living in our life. So let's read Luke 13 now and get on with this. Luke 13, verses 10 to 13. Now he, Yeshua, Jesus, was teaching in one of the synagogues on the Sabbath. Note that this was on the Sabbath, a day of rest, a day of peace. Shabbat, Shabbat, we say. And behold, there was a woman who had a spirit of infirmity. That literally means weakness, spirit of weakness, infirmity. Eighteen years, eighteen years uh, she 
was bent over and could no way raise herself up. She couldn't stand up tall. She couldn't stand straight, just way bent over. But when Jesus saw her, he called her to him and said, Woman, I, in my mind, I picture this as being very gentle. He may have put his hand on her shoulder, but it just says he said to her, probably something like, Dear woman, woman, you are loosed from your infirmity. And he laid his, oh, he does lay, he laid his hands on her, and immediately she was made straight and glorified God. Spirit of infirmity is what it says in the King James and the New King James and a couple others. The NIV, the New Living Translation, have it as had been crippled. She had been crippled by the spirit. A disabling spirit, or as the Berean Bible says, has been disabled, had been disabled by a spirit. The NASB, the New American Standard, had a sickness caused by a spirit. Okay, so you follow what I'm, what I'm saying here? And by the way, if any of you don't have the free Bible Hub application, you should get it and use it. It can help you so much with other translations, topical studies, the Greek Hebrew, the Greek and Hebrew or, or original words, and so on. Anyway, so anyway, Jesus then explained clearly that this woman was a woman whom Satan has bound. Whom Satan has bound. But Jesus commanded that spirit, maybe Satan himself, to loosen her from bondage. Now, he got criticized for healing this woman on the Sabbath. Can you imagine that? In verses 15 to 16, the Lord then answered this guy who criticized them and said, If you want to all get healed, come here on the other six days. Don't come here on the Sabbath. It's a rest day, not a work day. See, healing was considered work. <laughs> Verse 15, Then the Lord answered him and said, Hypocrite, does not each one of you on the Sabbath loose his ox or donkey from the stall and lead it away to water it? So, if you untie a donkey to make it feel better and give it water, he's saying, ought not this woman, being a daughter of Abraham, it's the first time that the phrase that we know of, daughter of Abraham, was used. And this is elevating women. Uh, Jesus was real good at that. So could not this woman, a daughter of Abraham, whom Satan has bound, think of it, 18 years, be loosed from this bond on the Sabbath? On the day of rest, on the day of stop. So this woman had suffered 18 years from this demon, but in one instant, Yeshua showed his power and commanded her release and healing, and it was done. This was on the Sabbath day, symbolizing the peace we, we, she and we should now experience. The way our Savior responded with compassion and encouragement should remind us all what a wonderful, wonderful... Uh, what a wonderful Savior we have. He's really just remarkable. And, um, hang on, just got to do something here. So we find Jesus himself teaching us that for 18 years, Satan caused this woman to be bent over. And this is not saying, and I'm not saying, that every health issue that goes on for a long time is, is caused by a, a foul spirit or a demon. I'm not saying that. I'm saying it could be, at times, notice Satan himself, or Satan bound this daughter of Abraham. But again, not all disease is caused by demons. So please don't go there. Please don't. Please don't think I'm going there. I'm not. Let's turn to Matthew 4, 23 and 24. Here's an example where all kinds of people were having all kinds of illnesses were coming to Jesus for healing and he healed them. And there's an allusion or a, a, a mention of those who were possessed of demons, but, but not in context with all of these. So, so please understand what I'm saying. Matthew 4, verses 23 to 24, Jesus went about all Galilee, teaching in their synagogues, preaching the gospel of the kingdom, and healing all kinds of sicknesses and all kinds of disease among the people. Then his fame went throughout all Syria, and they brought him all the sick people who were afflicted with various diseases and torments. Matthew 4, 24, I'm reading. And those who were demon-possessed, epileptics, paralytics, and he healed them. So it's not saying that they all were demon-possessed. He was saying he healed the paralytics, he healed the epileptics, he healed those with various torments and diseases, and some were demon-possessed. So yes, there is a spirit of affliction that can come upon us. Now, how involved can Satan be with God's children? Notice that Jesus said the woman with the, who was bent over, couldn't stand up straight, was a child, a daughter of Abraham. 
Who are the kids, the children of Abraham today? Galatians 3, 7 says that, Therefore we know that only those who are of the faith are sons of Abraham. So it's not just those who are direct descendants of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob and the 12 tribes, but in the new covenant, it's anyone who is a believer in Jesus Christ who are of the faith that puts you into the category of being a child, a son, a daughter of Abraham. <clears throat> My question, though, is if you're a child of God, a child of Abraham, that way, can evil spirits be trying to influence you or even cause an illness onto you? I'm going to show it can happen, though they think really, it seems clear to me, they have to get permission. So be on guard and don't even let them have a tiny crack that can open a door to, to, to them coming into you if God gives permission. Galatians 3, 26 to 29, writing to Gentile Galatians. There were some Jews in there, but primarily Gentiles. Galatians 3, 26 to 29, you're all sons of God through faith in Christ Jesus. It's like 3, 7 said. Verse 27, Galatians 3, 27, 28, 29. For as many of you as were baptized into Christ, you might want to uh, hear my sermon, uh, into whom were you baptized or should we be baptized? And I showed in that, that the, the wording at the end of Matthew 28, 19, into the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, the Trinity, basically, uh, was not in the original. So you might want to go back and hear that. And like he says right here, those of you who were baptized into Christ, he doesn't say those of you baptized into the Father, Son, and, and you know, Father, Son, Holy Spirit. There is neither Jew nor Greek, verse 28, Galatians 3, 28. There is neither slave nor free. There is neither male nor female. For as far as God's concerned, you're all one in Christ Jesus. And if you are Christ, then you are Abraham's seed. I don't care if you're a Kenyan or a Filipino or a Mexican or American. If we are in Christ, we are heirs of the promises made to Abraham and co-heirs with Christ. No matter our, co our color, our ethnicity, anything like that, what country we live in, those things don't matter in the New Covenant. So watch the next examples of how even children of God and true believers can still have Satan come after us. Even in the Old Testament, surely we're all familiar with the story of Job and how it was Satan who struck even him, righteous man, the most righteous man on the earth at that time, with boils from head to toe. Let's read Job 2, verse 7. After God gave him permission, okay, you can strike him himself, just don't kill him. So Satan went out from the presence of Jehovah and struck Job, Satan did. Job 2, verse 7. Satan went out from God's presence and struck Job with painful boils from the sole of his foot to the crown of his head. Remember again, Job was a very godly man, and yet this still was allowed to happen to him. So even being a child of God or super godly does not mean that Satan, if given permission, can't strike you or me. Uh, now, as far as coming after us to a degree, remember that even... Paul, who was allowed to see incredible glories in heaven that he wasn't allowed to tell us about, and lest I be conceited by it, he said, God allowed Satan to put a thorn in my flesh, whatever that literally was, he doesn't say, but he does call it a messenger of Satan sent to buffet me, 2 Corinthians 12, 7. Even the apostle Paul had some kind of physical illness or bad eyes or pain or something that was a messenger of Satan sent, sent to buffet him. Now even Peter, excuse me, uh, Jesus had to rebuke Peter. I don't mean Peter, I mean Satan. He rebuked Satan, influencing Peter when Christ had been saying, well, let's read it, Mark 8. Verses 31 to 33, Christ had been saying what's going to befall him. He began to teach them that the Son of Man must suffer many, many things and be rejected by the elders and chief priests and scribes and be killed and after three days rise again. Sometimes it says third day, here it says after three days rise again. 
he spoke this word openly. Then Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him. Okay, so, <laughs> no, no, uh, that's not going to happen, he says. But when he had turned around and looked at his disciples, Jesus rebuked Peter, saying, Get behind me, Satan! Imagine the Son of God looking you in the eye someday and ever saying that to you, Get behind me, Satan! See, he wasn't talking to Satan that with that sense. I mean, to Peter in that sense. He was talking to Satan. For you're not mindful of the things of God, but of the things of men. That was all said to Satan. Another time, uh, Jesus told Peter, you know, P Peter, Satan has asked for you. He's asked, asked for you that he could have you and whatever would happen. But I have prayed for you. Luke 22, I pray that. I pray to Jesus to please pray for me too and be my advocate, my intercessor, which he is. So perhaps Satan and demons are asking to be able to come into your life too, like they were with Peter apparently. So I'm hoping you're seeing that even though we're children of God, we have to always be on our guard because I'm sure Satan is more interested in you than he's interested in people of the world who are not believers. So there's more going on than we might want to think, but when it comes to believers in Christ, they, they, they can affect us, but only as far as God allows. Now, there are more examples of evil spirits and demons, uh, how they can be involved in illness. It doesn't mean they control the person's mind or that the person being healed is possessed. It doesn't mean that the person being healed is possessed by that demon. There was no indication the woman who was bent over, who was in the synagogue on the Sabbath, was possessed by the demon. It's just that the demon had put some kind of illness into her. So I'm not saying possessions involved here, but it's clear that there sometimes, sometimes the ones that Jesus healed involved a demon possessed person. Sometimes. It's clear though that there's a demon causing an illness in some cases. I know, I know. Most ministers don't want to touch it. Hey guys, but it's in the Bible. Acts 19, verse 11 and 12. Verses 11 and 12. Acts 19, verses 11 and 12. God worked unusual miracles by the hands of Paul. See, God did it. He used Paul. I'm going to give a sermon soon on how God wants to get us involved and, and be used in his, in his work. And uh, I think you'll like that sermon. It'll be my one, probably the one after this, if that's what God wills. Verse 12, so that even handkerchiefs or aprons were brought from his body to the sick. We call those anointed cloths today. Handkerchiefs or aprons were brought from his body to the sick, and the diseases left them, and the evil spirits went out of them. Are you seeing the connection that sometimes there definitely is a connection? I am praying more and more as I pray that if there be any spirit involvement here, in Jesus' name I rebuke you, leave this person unbind this un, yeah unbind this person I'm not casting out a demon I'm casting out anything being bound I just read to you that even some of the anointing cloths that Paul sent it says the diseases left them and the evil spirits went out of them Acts 19 12 now Matthew 9 verses 32 and 33 as they went behold they brought him to a man mute and demon possessed mute and demon possessed. When the demon was cast out, the mute spoke, and the multitudes marveled, saying it was never seen like this in Israel. There could be people who've been deaf for a long, long time, who perhaps have, a bound, have been bound by, by a spirit, need to be unbound. Okay, so this man was possessed of demons, but in my first example, the woman who was severely bent over for 18 years, it seems she was bound with that infirmity, but not necessarily possessed. So please get what I'm saying here, a balance. Because of that woman's example, I have to wonder if in some cases even today, if even godly and nice people, like godly like Job, who have long-standing body and health issues, could it be that they might be bound by a spirit of infirmity as well? Could it be? All these verses I'm reading to you. Okay, but surely when anointing and praying for people, we can speak power into people by saying, if a foul spirit has bound this person, I command you in Jesus' name, leave. Leave. Take off your bondage. And I mean right now. 
In Jesus' name, I mean right now. That's what we should be able to say. Even if I could be bound by, even I could be bound by Satan sometime and some infirmity, but not necessarily demon-possessed. In a case like that, I'll, I'll, I would say let the minister speak his prayer of healing without limiting his options. Once you're loose, there's no shame in proclaiming victory over the spirit world. Luke 8, verses 1 to 3, it's an interesting passage. Luke 8, verses 1 to 3. Luke 8, verses 1 to 3. It came to pass afterwards, he went throughout every city and village, preaching and bringing the glad tidings of the kingdom of God. And the twelve were with him. And certain women who had been healed, healed of certain of evil spirits and infirmities. They'd been healed of sicknesses. They'd been healed of evil spirits and infirmities. So in some cases, they were a combination, perhaps, of both. Or some, in some cases, it was one or the other. Mary, called Magdalene, out of whom had come seven demons. By the way, there's nothing in the Bible, nothing, that indicates that Mary had been a whore or anything like that. Uh, that, that that's become a, a rumor or gossip very commonly heard in the Catholic Church and others. It's just not in the Bible, folks. She had seven demons. And who knows what, what could have been happening with those demons? Who knows? And Joanna, the wife of Chusa, Herod's steward, and Susanna, and many others who provided for him from their substance. So these were apparently, some of them anyway, wealthy women who were able to uh, help buy food or things like that that were needed. And there again, healing and commanding evil spirits to leave are shown hand in hand in, at times. Now, are we to think we have less demonic activity today than in Jesus' day? Folks, please, I hope we know better. But be careful not to open the door to evil spirits. What are the doors that can open them? That can, if you crack the door open and God sees that we're being careless. I do have sermons on demons. Just look it up in the search bar. God tells us, God told Israel in Deuteronomy, remember we're spiritual Israel. In Deuteronomy 18, verses 9 to 14. He says, when you come into the land the Lord your God is giving you, don't learn their abominations. There shall not be found among you anyone who makes his son or daughter pass through the fire. And I mean even those who, who take a, a Tony Robbins course and walk across you know, coals of fire. Don't do it. Don't do it. There should be no one who practices witchcraft, soothsayer, interprets omens, a sorcerer, or one who conjures spells, a medium, a spiritist, or one who calls up the dead. He says these are an abomination. That's why I'm driving them out of the land. Don't do it. Don't get involved in that. But you can go to any uh, bookstore, and there's a whole section on witchcraft and, and this kind of stuff. And it, it's just pathetic. And you'll often see young girls and young, young boys, and by young I mean teenagers, who are browsing through them. It, it, it's, it's horrible. Anyway, otherwise, we can also be posting the welcome sign here to evil spirits if we're getting involved in certain things. So let me enumerate them. He, I just read them to you in Deuteronomy 18, but there's more. Don't participate, ever, ever. You might be curious in seances or trying to contact your dead father, dead grandfather, going to fortune uh, tellers, palm readers, card readers, crystal ball gazers. No, never, never. Not for a lark, not for fun, never. God hates it. Never seek to see or pray to your angel or ever wish to worship any angel. God's angels won't allow it. If an angel speaks to you, fine, you can speak back, but test the, test the spirits. First John 4 talks about testing the spirits. Most likely, if uh, they, they want any kind of worship or adoration, then for sure it's not a, an angel of God. They just don't allow it. Book of Revelation, I think John twice tried to uh, bow down to an angel. The angel just said, no, no, stop, stop. We're, I'm a servant just like you. Don't bow down to me. Never, yet remember what Satan said to Jesus when, you know, during the four temptations, uh, three temptations. He said, just bow down to me and worship me and I'll give you all these kingdoms. See, Satan wants to be worshipped. He wants to be adored. He appears as an angel of light sometimes. So be very careful about your friends who might be encouraging you to contact your angel. Don't do it. 
Never, ever, ever play with Ouija boards. If you have one, repent and then burn it. Never, ever read your horoscope. Never, ever dabble with hypnotism. Don't give up control of your mind to someone else. You're clearly on thin ice, shaky ground when you're doing that. Part of that giving up your mind and control of your mind is drug addiction. It muddles up your mind, makes it easier for evil spirits to come into your life. Any of you hearing this who are addicted to drugs, you could find yourself dealing with a demon in your life. And you've opened the door to them. Don't do it. They don't come in all the time, but don't open the door. Any of you in Africa and Haiti, especially a Haiti in Africa, never ever have anything to do with voodoo and black magic. Never ever have anything to do with local witch doctors. Don't fear them if they say they put a hex or a curse on you. We have the victory over Satan and his demons, his fallen angels, and he who is in us is greater than he who is in the world, First John 4, 4, but don't tamper with them either. I rebuke them in Jesus' name, but don't tamper with them. Never in any way whatsoever get involved in Halloween. It's a night devoted to witches, demons, darkness, evil of all kinds. Don't get involved this year or any year ever again. There's no question God hates Halloween. Stop watching demonic topics, movies, TV shows like The Walking Dead or even Harry Potter movies or any movies, even ones that most people think are wonderful. Um, I, I'm not going to watch Star Wars anymore. I, I just watched some here recently and I realized, wow, some of these figures and people in here and some of the things they're doing, uh, this is not of God. Um, so uh, anyway, I don't. I'm not telling you you can't or don't. I'm just telling you I won't anymore. So sorcerers, all that, don't be involved in them. And here's one for all of us. Engaging in any ongoing repetitive sin that you're in a habit, you're, 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 you just do it over and over again, that you're allowing in your life. I know we can repent. We can ask God to forgive us. And I've had to and you've had to. But if there's a particular kind of sin or ser series of sins that we do just over and over and over again, that means we, we're bound. We're, we're in bondage. We're not overcoming it. So believers, children of God, we cannot, for example, ever, ever be looking at pornography or soft porn. Or maybe you have a, a penchant to break the Sabbath. Uh, just you're real casual and you, you do things you know break the Sabbath. You're working on the Sabbath. You're working overtime on the Sabbath. After sundown, you're watching things on TV that do not glorify God in the Sabbath. I'm going to give a sermon soon on Sabbath keeping. And, but anyway, so and, and don't don't compromise with these things. Um, I know many many believers are compromising. They don't call it porn, but we'll watch a, a movie that we that has a minute or two minutes or a few seconds of nudity and adultery, uh, it's wrong. It's just plain wrong. Whether it takes God's name in vain over and over and over, it uses the F word over and over and over. It, just stop it, folks. We don't, we don't have time left to be fooling around with any of this. I think it's opening the door to evil, to evil spirits. Certainly it doesn't open the door to righteousness when we do these things. But... Um, all of our sins were washed away when we accepted Jesus Christ as Savior, yes. But if we callously continue in a life of sin after that, we're playing with fire. Maybe the lake of fire. So we have to stop this ongoing repetitive sin stuff. I know the Holy Spirit guarantees our salvation, but if we denounce it and walk away from it, at best we'll be in the kingdom if we have continual sin and we're not overcoming, we'll be in the kingdom at best. And read 1 Corinthians 3, the end of it, and uh, 1 Corinthians 5, the end of it, and you'll see that some will be there, but as, through, as, as if they'd come through the fire. I've talked about that before in the sermons I gave on God's favor and grace. But read the story again in John 5 about the man who wanted to get in the pool to be healed, and Jesus healed him. But later that day when they met again, our Savior told this guy, and tells us, and what Jesus said implies that some sort of sin had been going on in his life and had brought him to that point of being so sick he could barely move. 
We're not told clearly what it was, but let's see what Jesus, what Yeshua said. John 5, 14. You know, an angel would come by, stir up the water, whoever was the first one in the water would be healed, was the story. Anyway, and so Jesus heals him, and he asks him, do you want to be healed? We have a blog on that, same title. You might want to search the search bar, do you want to be healed? Or do you want to be made well, I think is what the title is. Do you want to be made well? John 5, 14, afterwards Jesus found him in the temple, he's now healed, and he said to him, see, you have been made well. Sin no more, lest a worse thing come upon you. I think he's probably referring to any habitual sin or things that had brought it on in the first place in the past. Sin no more, lest a worse thing come upon you. God's holy children, you and I, should not be finding any entertainment, any entertainment value in watching sinners sin. Over the years, I've had to repent of getting very lax in some issues myself. Can you admit to it? I can. Together, let's all children of God turn back to God. Wake up. Become zealous again. Seek our God. Watch far less TV, far less movies, far less uh, social media. What careless, ongoing evils and sins are we allowing to remain in our lives? How are we blocking the fruit of God's Spirit from maturing inside of us, from making us loving and joyful, peaceful and kind, tender-hearted and uh, self-controlled and all, this, all the fruit of the Spirit? I speak to you who have repented and accepted Christ as your Savior and were baptized and had the laying out of hands. You're the ones I'm talking to. Are we putting other things in God's first before God so we don't even make time to put God first? Seek you first. The kingdom of God still in your Bible, Matthew 6, 33. And I have to make sure that I do that. You have to. If we don't, and we're staying up late night watching stuff we shouldn't and doing things we shouldn't, come on, guys. Too many men of God are, are hooked on porn. They've admitted that to me. I mean, I'm talking about a few dozen over the years on their laptops, cell phones, computers. Talk about opening doors to the evil world. Repent of this deeply and turn back to the way of our holy God. And if you're hooked on any of these sins, then ask God to rebuke that bondage you've been put into or that you're now into. Whether it's bondage of alcohol, whether it's a bondage of worry. Worrying is a sin. Jesus said, don't worry. We're making the object of the worry greater than God. That's a sin. Whatever bondage or sins that you can't seem to get rid of, just ask God to rebuke any evil spirits involved in that in your life. And I know you've been forgiven, and I have. But if and when we can't overcome, perhaps there's some bondage going on. Ephesians 6, verses 10 to 13 Ephesians 6, verse 10 to 13, Finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the power of His might. He overcame Satan. He overcame the world. He overcame any temptations. We fight Christ. I'm sorry, we fight Satan in the power of Christ's might. Ephesians 6, 10, I just read it. Be strong in the Lord and the power of His might. Put on, take it up. Put it on. This whole armor of God. Most of us, many of us, can start a day and get out there and we don't even have our spiritual underwear on, let alone the whole armor of God. He says, put on the whole armor so you can fight and win. Ephesians 6, 11, verse 12, for we don't wrestle against fresh. Your enemies are not people. Your boss, your neighbor, your family members who are acting strange or whatever. No, your enemies are are the are demons. That's what he says in verse 12. Therefore, take up the whole armor of God, that you may be able to withstand in the evil day. And having done all to stand, to stand. But too many of us don't take the spiritual warfare that we're right in the middle of too seriously. So we leave off the helmet of salvation that protects our head and our thinking. We don't pick up the shield of faith to quench the fiery darts of doubt and disbelief and fear. 
We don't put on the breastplate of righteousness. We don't engage the sword, which is the Holy Spirit, the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. And everything else that's mentioned in here. So no wonder we're struggling with sin that doesn't get overcome. That could be bondage. And if we're still not praying first thing every day, we're surely not taking up the armor of God and must repent of this. Where, were, where would we go? Where, what would we be doing? What would we be watching if we were truly aware of Christ's presence, not just beside us, but in us? If we could see him, would we walk where we walk? Would we go where we go? Would we talk the way we talk sometimes? Would we act the way we act? Now, Jesus had friends who sinned. Thank God I can know that because I know I've been a sinner. And I can still call him my friend and know that he that I am his friend. There's no record Jesus ever participated in any sin or he couldn't have been our savior. This much I'm sure of, though, I think we're going to see more and more and more demonic activity in the years ahead. And I think if you think you're seeing some strange things, especially in the last couple of years, 2020 to present, as the saying goes, we ain't seen nothing yet. Once the worst of the worst demons are released out of their prison, Revelation 9, the, bomb, the, the, the um, bottomless pit, we're going to see some, and hear, and watch some very, very strange and terrifying things unless we know our God. But we have victory in Christ if we claim it. We have victory in Him. By His shed blood on Golgotha, we can take the blood of Christ on the cross and confront any demonic activity with that. They have to leave. They have to leave. In Jesus' name, we can ask them to leave. Command them to leave, not just ask them. So use this time now we have before Christ returns best you can to seek him. Seek the Father as never before. And if you seek him with all your might and all your being, you will surely find him. And God is very pleased with those who seek him and he will you know who seek him with all their all their might Hebrews 11:6 So any sinful addiction you have give it up in Jesus name command that addiction to leave you I'm referring to all the repetitive sins we keep doing over and over again flirting flirting adultery fornication in the mind if we lust after a woman, or if you women lust after a man, you've already committed adultery in your heart. Jesus said that. Sins like not loving our wife the way we should, loving her alone. Sins not being one with our spouse. Not honoring our dad and mom. Getting drunk. Being lax about Sabbath. Putting other things, gods before God. Like social media, TV. Anything we put ahead of God so we don't have time to pray today. Claim and confess your victory in God and His Son. Command the evil spirits to put your, uh, to quit trying to put thoughts in your head. And when you realize that, command them to leave in the name of Jesus Christ. Abide in Christ as never before. So going forward, when I anoint someone for healing, especially when it's been a physical or health problem that's gone on and on and on after year after year, I often now will include in my prayers, and I often have anyway in the past, if there's any spirit of infirmity involved here in Jesus' name, by his power and by his authority, I command you in Jesus' name to leave him now, to release him, to release her from this bondage. And I mean now, get out. It doesn't mean I'm saying you're possessed by a devil. I'm saying that you might have... A sickness, a, you might have a bondage, you're bound with a sickness, a spirit of infirmity that has bound you, or me. And we have so much godly power, we're not using or even tapping into. Let's change all that. Jesus said, if we truly believe in him, that we would be able to do even greater things, greater works than he did. Can you imagine that? Let's end with that, John 14, verses 12 to 13. Most assuredly, I say unto you, he who believes in me. Do you believe in him? If 
you believe in him, act like you do. Act like you do. I preach to myself too. I say to you, he who believes in me, the works that I do, he will also do. Healing the sick, multiplying the loaves, walking on water, raising the dead. Anything Jesus did, he's saying right here, if we believe in him, we'll do that, at least that, and greater. And greater works than these he will do, because I go to my Father. And whatsoever you ask in my name, I'm reading John 14, verse 12 and 13. Whatsoever things you ask in my name, that I will do, that the Father may be glorified in the Son. Hallelujah, brethren. Praise our Savior and our Father in heaven. May we all always have total victory over the adversary and his evil troops. Father in heaven, we come before you with raised hands of worship, bowed, bowed heads and raised hands. <laughs> Father in heaven, we just... I, I, I pray this sermon, this teaching will go to the right people it needs to, who need to hear it. Maybe we all need it. I need it. We need to come out of any bondage and be totally free. And we know even Paul had a, something of Satan, the messenger of Satan, the thorn in the flesh. Even Job, Peter. So it can happen to me, it can happen to all those hearing this. In Jesus' name we ask you, please, come down, fill us with your anointing, fill us with your Holy Spirit. Let us speak your words, think your thoughts, do your deeds, do your works. Let us be changing. Let us be Philadelphian, let's repent of any Laodiceanism, any lukewarmness. Let's seek you more than we ever have before. Please help us do that. Help me do that too, Father. May your word go out to many, many people around the world. Thank you for all your blessings. Look out over us. Smile upon us. May your face shine over upon us. May you bring us peace and shalom. Father, please send Jesus back soon. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.